Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are on the globe. Uh, welcome to the Indusoft webinar series. Today is June 24, 2015. My name is Richard Clark, and also on the line uh, is uh, Fabio Terracino, who I will formally introduce in a moment. Our topic today is cybersecurity, and I thought for this webinar we'd do something slightly different um, and have a little bit different discussion than what our technical webinars usually follow. Uh, we'll look at some current events and how they might apply to you in your system today. Uh, and we'll look at some techniques and recommendations uh, for protecting your system and how to dis and, and uh, discuss how it can be made more secure. And then finally, uh, the last part of the webinar will be Fabio, and he'll discuss how you can use uh, the Indusoft Web Studio data protection and encryption to tighten up your application and control system. While we're waiting for the last few people to come on, I have a few preliminary announcements. Uh, as I said, my name is Richard Clark, and I am a technical resource for Indusoft Marketing. And I've been a process automation and cybersecurity engineer for, well, here's my bio, which much of it was lifted from my LinkedIn profile. So if you're interested, you can see the whole thing there. And our second speaker today is uh, Fabio Terrazino, who I mentioned. He's the Director of Engineering and Consulting Services here at Indusoft. Uh, Fabio has been with Indusoft for more than 16 years and has an extensive background in industrial control systems, SCADA cybersecurity, uh, application design and integration, and uh, product development, and directs a fine team of application engineers. Before we begin, uh, I do have a few short announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, this is an audio broadcast WebEx. So we can't hear you if you speak. Use the Q&A or chat field in the WebEx interface for your questions. And we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Next, uh, if you fill out the webinar survey, which will come to the email address that you use to uh, register for the event, we'll send you one of our famous webinar series t-shirts and continue to send you upcoming webinar announcements at that same email address. The next item that we have is that services on demand is available in one hour blocks. And Fabio will talk uh, to this point more uh, later in the webinar. Uh, the service um, can help make your application development and implementation easier and more secure during, um, um, and he'll talk about this during his section of the webinar. To sign up for and schedule the services on demand, go to our homepage, hover over products and services, and then over services, and select the link services on demand to get to the product page. Note that there is a two-hour minimum when you speak to an engineer. Uh, I also want to remind you that we have two cybersecurity ebooks available from Smashwords.com as uh, Name Your Price. The, industri uh, the Indusoft Security Guide is a condensation of security guidance for your applications, networks, and enterprises that we've offered to our customers over time. All the cybersecurity information that you're looking for is available in this one handy ebook, available in many formats, depending on how you'd like to view it uh, and the type of device that you use. Also, we collaborated with Professor Stephen Miller of uh, Eastern New Mexico University at Ruidoso to uh, create the framework for SCADA cybersecurity ebook, which is being used as a classroom textbook in his SCADA and cybersecurity curriculums. We have a couple of webinars that I'll show you later in our archives, uh, which discusses these eBooks in detail, along with using the US CERT uh, CSET tool in some detail. Go to our website, hover over support, then video library, and select webinars to see the archives. Uh, as always, if you feel that either of these eBooks has benefited you in, in any way, you can pay or donate any amount that you want to when you download them and all profits will go directly to the ENMU Foundation. All donations are tax deductible. So here's the webinar agenda of what we'll discuss today. We've already had the introductions, and I've already uh, discussed our ebooks, the webinar archives, and introduced the engineering consultant consulting services that Fabio will discuss in more detail. We'll look over some current events that may be pertinent or of interest to you. 
We'll also look at the current state of cybersecurity for industrial control and SCADA systems and how that subject might relate to you. I'll talk about some of the current uh, discussions about protecting ICS and SCADA systems and networks and platforms, and also some of the ways to understand remediation and corrective needs for your own systems, including using the NIST cybersecurity framework and the CSET tool uh, to help you with gap analyses and constructing a risk assessment. And finally, Fabio will take the last half of our time together to discuss and demonstrate how to make your Indusoft Web Studio application more secure, along with protecting and encrypting your data, the FIN clients, and any other any communication link, links to various devices that you might be using. So where do we even start such that this cybersecurity background noise um, in the media begins to make sense to us? giving us some sort of usable story to follow in creating a 10,000-foot overview to have in mind so that we can proceed with our own understanding and systems analysis. Lately, there have been many cybersecurity events in the national and global news featuring a heretofore unprecedented number of cyber incidents. You've probably heard about the majority of the most recent retail and uh, business and administrative attacks and breaches, and not that they aren't important, but actually the ones we're more interested in are the events involving industrial control systems, DCSs, SCADA, HMI systems, etc. Therefore, the best place to start is, what is with what is really known, such as a recap of recent ICS and SCADA cyber events, what we've learned from them, and what remediation techniques have been suggested and implemented by various cybersecurity professionals and companies. A good starting place is with Stuxnet, which really started serious cybersecurity dialogues in every industry using automation and control systems of every kind. When it was covered in the news media, many people began to wonder if their own control systems were vulnerable to Stuxnet attacks. And a lot of cybersecurity professionals were initially scared out of their wits at this, which at the time was evident by the incredible amount of silence, secrecy, speculation, and misinformation surrounding the attack. The reason for all this was that uh, was the su surprising ferocity, diversity on many fronts, and sophistication of the cyber attack, along with the unprecedented amount of physical damage that it caused, as well for the specificity of the Iranian nuclear weapons facility being the only target. Many cybersecurity companies started analyzing the attack pattern immediately in their war rooms initially concluding that it was a simple surgical strike against a very specific target. This initially caused a little bit of relief because the Stuxnet infiltration did not appear to be a broad-based attack across a wide spectrum of unsecured control systems, but instead the attack was only directed against this one single facility. This realization ultimately led to one ulti uh, uh, ultimate likely conclusion because of the following theorized analyses and findings. Uh, first, uh, the sophistication of the programming of the malware, some of which was covered by re uh, re uncovered by reverse engineering, that is, and could only have been done by a large, coordinated team of professional developers. Next, the specificity and required intimate insider knowledge of the control systems and their networks and the configurations the zero-day exploits of the unpatched Siemens PLCs that they were using and the insider knowledge that they actually were unpatched, the differing vectors of infection and spread, which initially was likely a USB drive, then appeared to spread through the network connectivity and printer ports to other computers using administrator credentials. The fact that it stayed dormant and surreptitious for a long time before becoming active apparently reporting to some home base, a CNC or command and control center with findings at various intervals. And then uh, apparently receiving updated instructions from the CNC before proceeding with um, machine infiltration and attack vectors. The apparent social engineering that had been uh, used to gain such intimate access to the systems which ultimately led to attacking and reprogramming the PLCs to control the centrifuge VFDs or variable frequency drives in a completely different way 
than was originally intended and programmed. And to operate slowly and surreptitiously over weeks and months in order to pre, uh, pre, prematurely wear out or severely damage the equipment, <clears throat> excuse me, ultimately limiting and destroying the production lines along with another, uh, a, a number of other factors. So the ultimate conclusion was that Stuxnet was a deliberate, single targeted attack by one or more nation states. So is Stuxnet actually a danger to your control system or platform? The answer is yes and no. Stuxnet, as it was used, could only work on one targeted system and no other system or platform because it was specifically tailored to it, requiring a great deal of initial on-site reconnaissance or insider knowledge. Some bits of the Stuxnet code has been found in other types of malware in the wild, indicating that people are attempting to exploit some of the sophistication in the original attack software for their own purposes. Malware antivirus companies have since updated their databases to protect against the discovered Stuxnet light code in other malware. US ICS CERT has issued discussion and guidance as needed or required, along with much discussion in many industry blogs and forums. Additionally, the zero-day exploits used in the Siemens PLCs have been patched, and all that series of PLCs with the vulnerability should have been immediately updated if they, uh, if they have not already uh, been by the, uh, the people who own them. Uh, Stuxnet employed a very sophisticated man-in-the-middle scheme to spoof the HMIs into thinking that the, the PLCs and VFDs were operating correctly, requiring on-the-fly programming of the PLCs. So moving forward in time uh, to 2012, uh, in 2012, uh, Shamoon malware infected Aramco and uh, destroyed data on at least 30,000 computers and possibly up to 50,000 or 55,000 machines were affected. Experts agree that Shamoon was not particularly sophisticated and that, uh, or since a number of errors were found in the code, and that a number of, uh, and that, that the developers were skilled amateurs and not in the same league as Stuxnet and Flame, as is shown here. That same year, Dooku and Flame malware did utilize some Stuxnet modules and functionality and appeared to simply infiltrate control systems using a set of tools that was uh, similar to Stuxnet's and basically just gather intelligence and data and report back to the CNC or command and control centers. In 2013 and 14, uh, Dragonfly malware and RAT or remote access trojans or tools began to make an appearance and took advantage of exploits in DCOM and OPCDA functionality. On July 3rd, 2014, Indisoft published a blog, which you may remember if you follow our corporate blogs, containing information and guidance from, the, from US CERT on what Dragonfly and Havex was, what problems they caused, and what steps you should take to protect your control systems since they used OBCDA exploits. Uh, in either of these attacks, no actual attempts were made to actually control the SCADA systems, but only to gather data and report back to a CNC home base. Then in December 2014, during the various end-of-year news reports of the Sony hack, combined with a general news blackout by the German news services, and only appearing in the annual report of the, Fed, of the German Federal Office for in uh, Information Security, or the BSAE, uh, and, store, and the story only first appearing in the BBC, about a cyber attack at an undisclosed German steel mill doing a substantial amount of physical damage. The attack was a result of spear phishing or sending booby-trapped emails containing a malware payload that quickly embedded itself and ultimately gave access to the plant's industrial control system by allowing the, the uh, attackers to steal login log credentials that access the mill's control systems. Basically, the attackers caused a blast furnace to be shut down in an uncontrolled manner. Here's the article as appeared in the BBC News on December 22, 2014, and it was followed up in January of 2015 in a Wired magazine article. 
When the attackers were able to gain control of the SCADA system, they appeared to have caused an unscheduled shutdown of, the bla of a blast furnace, which led to a substantial amount of damage at the mill. Though the actual details of the attack and damage were obfuscated, the Bay SAE uh, stated that the attacks, uh, the attackers were very sophisticated in their attacks, and phishing techniques uh, and the phishing techniques that they used allowed uh, access to administrator logon credentials for the control systems. They went on to say that the attackers had e had evident technical capabilities, quote unquote and showed familiarity with both conventional IT systems and had substantial understanding and knowledge that needed to, that, that what was needed to uh, manipulate the specialized software used for the SCADA systems controlling the operation of the mill. Dell reported that cyber attacks against uh, super, supervisory control and data acquisition or, or SCADA systems doubled in 2014, according to the annual published threat report. Dell SonicWall saw global SCADA attacks increase against its customer base from uh, 91,500 roughly in January 2012 to 163,000, a little bit over that, in January 2013. And uh, in 2014, uh, there were 675,186 attacks reported. Attacks against SCADA systems are on the rise and tend to be political in nature as they target operational capabilities within power plants, factories, and refineries, the tech firm said. Notice that the various key attack methods on the pie chart that are around 25, that around 25% of them occurred because of bu buffer overflow issues. And another 50% of the attacks were exploits in the SCADA software itself or the uh, OS vulnerabilities and zero day exploits. And the last 25% of the attacks were entirely preventable which were due to credential management problems, uh, improper network configurations, no malware management, or missing antivirus software, et cetera, et cetera. They determined that the data focus attacks were motivated, motivated by financial gain, uh, where SCADA attacks um, were more likely politically motivated for the most part and were aimed principally at critical infrastructure. As the chart showed, Dell stated that 25% of the attacks were due to buffer overflow issues by various SCADA manufacturers of hardware and software. The report went on to say that ICS CERT has issued alerts for multiple campaigns over the past year, including one which focused on the use of Havoc's RAT in attacks uh, at ICS and second um, related to uh, black energy attacks that were exploiting vulnerabilities in products from GE, uh, Advantech, Broadwin, and Siemens. And in other interesting stories that happened in April and May, uh, Sean McConnell, uh, the CEO of BitSight, which specializes in business security preparedness, has a few comments in this article posted by databreachtoday.com on April 9th that are pertinent to our discussions. Uh, here are some points that are taken from the article. These emerging attacks are now being waged against a much wider variety of hardware, including mobile devices, he explains, in this exclusive uh, executive session interview with Information Security Media Group. Uh, there is no perimeter anymore, he says. There are much more touch points in a company today, which in turn has made it easier for hackers to penetrate networks. Hackers, especially uh, nation state actors, know that most organizations fail to adequately address risks uh, posed to their networks by third parties, McConnell says. Uh, businesses today outsource everything, and it's hard to ensure security when you're outsourcing. Uh, hackers are increasingly target, targeting less secure third parties to ultimately gain access to organizations' primary networks, McConnell explains. You can't prevent hacks, but you should focus on the information, he says. You've got to be able to look at your third-party risk and have somebody on your team who's looking at that risk regularly. On April 9th, databreachtoday.com reported that White Lodging Services Corp. revealed a malware attack against um, their point-of-sale point terminals, POS terminals, 
at 10 of the hotels it manages. <clears throat> the first attack took place about a year earlier. On April 9th, um, databreachtoday.com also reported the upcoming RSA conference in 2015 in San Francisco will feature sessions ripped from the headlines. Uh, as the RSA conference chair, Hugh Thompson, notes in an interview with um, uh, Information Security Media Group, the show reflects the news of the day as security leaders and vendors discuss the impact of uh, recent breaches. There were something like 30,000 attendees at this conference, and um, this was quite a big deal. On April 10th, it was reported by databreachtoday.com that sympathizers of Islamic State terrorist group are exploiting a vulnerability in a world, world WordPress content management system plugin um, to deface the websites of news organizations, businesses, religious institutions, and governments in the U.S. and abroad, according to the FBI. Skipping over a number of stories, on April 24th, they reported that, that uh, the Pentagon updates cybersecurity defense strategy. Uh, the military, apparently now, is willing to use cyber warfare to protect U.S. interests. Uh, the DOD, or Department of Defense, has unveiled a, um, an updated cybersecurity strategy that officially acknowledges for the first time that the U.S. military is willing to use cyber warfare to defend U.S. interests against cyber attacks. On April 28th, they reported that uh, Adobe plans to settle their breach lawsuit. Uh, there was a class action suit that was filed over compromised cards and accounts. Uh, Adobe Systems is moving to settle a class action lawsuit that was filled in the wake of a series of data breaches. It first disclosed in October 2013. The breaches reportedly led to the compromise of more than 38 million customer accounts. On May 7th, uh, databreachtoday.com reported that uh, Lenovo is patching uh, critical PC flaws. Uh, after the Superfish malware, uh, there were fresh warnings over pre-installed software that come um, by default on, on uh, the computers that they sell. The story goes on to state that one flaw rated critical by the IOActive researchers centered on a race condition which attackers could have um, system update verify that an execute uh, sorry that an executable file was legitimate and then substitute a malicious executable in its place. Next story on May 12th, there was a report that unencrypted devices are still a breach headache. The on ongoing risk posed by lost, stolen, and mobile devices incidents uh, involving unencrypted laptops, storage media, and other computing devices are still popping up on the Department of Health and Human Services wall of shame. Also on May 12th, a story was, was reported about um, money that was taken from Starbucks accounts. Uh, this affected a wide variety of customers and involved the prepay card uh, that uh, Starbucks was using. Apparently, their accounts were uh, hacked, and um, because some were set for autofill, uh, the attackers could keep pulling money from people's checking accounts. So in the past three weeks, on June 10th, uh, databreachtoday.com said that uh, Duco 2.0 was discovered on the Kaspersky uh, antivirus um, networks. Uh, on June 11, um, both Apple and the White House announced that um, on um, applications used or created, uh, they've got to employ HTTPS from now on. And on June 12th, a report was, was released that said this breach of the data in the Office of Personnel Management uh, was found during a new pr product demo. Uh, they were demoing a new type of malware um, protection system, and uh, it uncovered um, this um, this uh, breach of data, um, and it was not discovered by the existing detect detection systems that they were currently employing. Also on June 12th, uh, EU police arrested a suspected Fisher gang of cyber criminals active in Italy, Spain, Poland, the UK, Belgium, and Georgia, who committed about uh, 6.7 million in fraud. That's a US dollars. Uh, the, the article goes on to explain how the networks were infiltrated and the crimes were committed. 
Uh, also on June 12th, uh, they reported that um, web-based electronic health record vendor Medical Informics Engineering and its personnel uh, health record subsidy, uh, no more clipboard, uh, dot com say a cyber attack has resulted in a data breach a data breach affecting some healthcare clients and an undisclosed number of patients stealing all their personal information on june fifteenth we reported that uh, Deutscher Bundestag or the German parliament has been battling infections that involve more than twenty thousand computers and many servers that may all need to be replaced it was reported that the Russians were behind the attacks. Uh, on June 16th, LastPass warns its users that it has detected surreptitious activity on its networks and advises all users to change their credentials to two-factor authentication immediately. On June 16th, also, um, YPRO um, has developed a fraud detection model based on the analysis of customers' big data. On June 17th, it was reported that the Houston Astros and uh, St. Louis Cardinals were subpoenaed by the FBI during their investigation of the Astros' confidential player database that was infiltrated by the Cardinals. And um, some of you remember uh, that story. On June 18th, um, DataBreachToday.com reported that Apple and Samsung both posted bug warnings. Um, they were pretty serious. The Samsung exploit affects nearly 600 million devices with a keyboard-related flaw, exposing, exposing users to potential attacks. And separately, researchers say that uh, they have identified a series of vulnerabilities dubbed Zara, that's X-A-R-A, in Apple um, iOS and OS 10 devices that allow them to sidestep the OS 10 sandbox. The flaws could be exploited by malware to steal data and passwords, for example, by cracking the built-in keychain password manager in OS 10. And on June 19th, um, NIST released a new guidance for non-federal systems uh, in NIST 800-171. Uh, the document is intended to guide federal agencies when negotiating contracts or other agreements to store and process CUI or controlled unclassified information with non-federal organizations such as private contractors, state, local, and tribal governments, colleges and universities, and think tanks. And on June 20th, it was reported in, um, that in Fortinet's annual security consensus report for 2015. <clears throat> excuse me, 2015, among the multiple vulnerabilities seen in products and solutions around endpoints, messaging, and applications, wireless networks are now the weakest links in an enterprise's IT infrastructure. There is rising concern over wireless security in organizations based in Asia Pacific and Japan. And finally, on June 22nd, it was reported, which was just a few days ago, it was reported that a hack attack ground some airplanes in Poland. Uh, the Polish airline LOT claims that a hack attack disrupted the state-owned airline's ground control computers, leaving it unable to issue flight plans and forcing it to delay or cancel flights, uh, grounding around 1,400 passengers. So what are the takeaways of all these stories? And there were, certainly were a lot just from the beginning of the year. First, uh, that cybercrime is on the increase with more than double the number of attacks since last year. Uh, that criminals involved uh, are everything from amateurs to nation states with deep pockets and many resources available to them. Uh, the trend is that SCADA and control system attacks will only increase using online tools that have been continually evolving since Stuxnet that people and organizations still use insufficient security to protect themselves and or their systems, uh, including everything from the most basic things like poor passport word enforcement to uh, more sophisticated security requirements showing, for instance, inadequate defense perimeters uh, and also relying on third-party vendors with no in-house checking or reviews. So what steps do you need to take? First, uh, you need to understand your assets and how they're configured together. In order to do this, you'll need to conduct a proper inventory of your assets. 
you'll need to understand their configurations and what risks that they might pose in those particular configurations or states. Next, classify your assets by category to help you with the gap analysis and risk assessments. You can create a number of asset categories which you can prioritize for security criticality. Additionally, uh, placing assets in various categories can help you define this, their security needs and requirements. When you understand these classifications and have a handle on their security requirements, then you can perform a gap analysis and a formal risk assessment. Here is a link to one blog describing how to do these various things that you might want to check out. You'll be able to get to the link uh, after we post this PowerPoint or web webinar on our recording website if you can't get it. Uh, and scribble it down right now because it's kind of long. Once you've completed your formal gap analysis, you'll be able to understand the scope of your security issues and what needs to be done to close those gaps. Then by performing your formal risk assessment on each of the gaps, you can determine the ROI for each one versus enduring the risk of the gap event occurring. Over time, as, cybersecurity, uh, as the cybersecurity landscape changes for your organization, these gaps and risks can be revisited and recalculated. This approach to and management of gap analysis and formal risk assessments of system and in, uh, organizational security is called the business process model, or BPM. Any ad hoc methods that were previously used for cybersecurity can be retired for a more formal and depth understanding of your security profile and risks that you're willing to assume. Note that adding or implementing various controls and layers of cybersecurity can be expensive or can take a long time to complete. Therefore, by committing to a formal analysis of your systems and organization's needs, you can implement security in appropriate steps and at a pace you can afford. There are tools that can assist you in performing these analyses. The NIST cybersecurity framework is a good place to start. Uh, you can download it from http um, whackwhacknist.com, I'm sorry, nist.gov. And uh, the methodology outlined in the framework can help you establish your own plan of attack for the project. Uh, many individuals from a wide variety of vertical industries and critical infrastructures help define the framework and the methodology that's been used uh, in the document. Uh, NIST simply recorded and condensed the data that the um, teams of volunteers came up with. Uh, I attended the sessions and was part of this process, which was quite uh, excellent. Another tool that can be extremely useful to you for this project is, is the CSET tool developed by US CERT. Uh, here's a link to the download page. And the tool can utilize any industry standards including uh, ISA, IEC, uh, ANSI, ISO, and NIST, and even your own company standards uh, if you already have them formally defined. These two ebooks that I mentioned earlier can help you out immensely. The NIST Cybersecurity Framework ebook describes both the framework and takes you through the necessary steps to complete it, and also discusses how to use the CSET tool in order to evaluate your automation processes, platforms, enterprise, or enterprise. Uh, our security guide discusses, discusses much of the guidance we uh, have provided in, in a condensed format uh, that is at your fingertips, including a, uh, many transcriptions of our uh, cybersecurity webinars by a large number of industry professionals. If you'd like to see more about the books and tools and have a look at these webinars available on our website, um, if you miss, uh, just use these links right here. Again, if you miss the links uh, in this live broadcast, wait till the webinar is posted uh, on our, um, in our blogs, our website, and you'll be able to get to all the links in this accompanying PowerPoint. In terms of specific cybersecurity guidance and differences between the systems, uh, it won't be possible to give you specific guidance that will help you with your processes, platform, or enterprise. Uh, this is because, as you already know, uh, that set of guidance, uh, that one set of guidance for a specific system may be entirely inappropriate for a different process, platform, or enterprise configuration. 
However, I can make certain generalities uh, that will be able to help you get started on your project. Network segregation between business systems and control systems is a good place to start. Note that using simple business-based firewalls are not adequate to protect control system networks and DMZs. Additionally, creating VLANs based on business side rules are completely ineffectual in stopping malware designed to infiltrate a control system. Here's a link to a blog that talks about this in more detail. If you're using a process historian and integrating it into an ERP system, it may be necessary to create tiered historians, placing the tier two historian in a DMZ. Firewalls that you choose for your control system should have stateful packet packet inspection with rules designed for control system networks. Fortinet, Tofino, McAfee, among others, are offering excellent appliances designed uh, for just this very thing. Products like uh, Lockheed Martin's Industrial Defender is a great uh, tool for keeping an eye on these appliances as well in your whole network. You may also want to establish various access controls for user roles and equipment or device-to-device -device authentication. Access point controls are used to control ingress and egress from your systems. You may want to look also at uh, system hardening as well. Uh, many computers that you buy contain a plethora of applications and programs that simply aren't used and can become entry points for various exploits and malware, as was shown in one of the news reports. You can reduce the surface area of attack vectors by closing unused ports and turn off uh, or remove unused services. Make sure that uh, user access is role-based rather than by individual user assignment. Using Active Directory or some other management system using LDAP along with a user uh, group security feature in Indusoft Web Studio can help you create secure user groups with least needed privilege. You can also add device control to segregate things like USB devices into their own DMZs or sandboxes when they're plugged in. More advanced forms of cybersecurity hardening could include a patching server uh, into the control system environment rather than relying on something outside the control system um, environment that could be infected with malware. Additionally, establish centralized uh, backups, establishing centralized backups rather, locally and offsite can save your bacon uh, when disaster or malware strikes and you need to get the system running again in a hurry. Uh, also, establish a establishing a logging server such as the uh, Lockheed Martin Industrial Defender, as I mentioned before, can go a long way in understanding malware attacks, system breaches, and unusual behavior within your system. Finally, performance monitoring, OEE dashboards, SPC, and many other systems or process analysis tools may be useful for detecting process problems or unusual issues that may or may not be cybersecurity related. Or you can simply look into a complete centralized management system that takes all of these functions and condenses them into a single unit or system. Some of these items are pricey, so this is, again, another reason to calculate your ROI in your gap analysis and risk assessment. When you come to considering, uh, that is when you come to considering these gap items uh, for your own uh, process or plant. So this is the end of my portion of the webinar. And uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Fabio to continue with the advanced security features of Indusoft Web Studio. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. So, for uh, I, I have a quick presentation here, and uh, the goal will be pretty much to focus a little bit more on Indusoft Web Studio on the product that we offer, and talk a little bit about the uh, security features, safety features that we have in the product to help you uh, design and deploy applications with Indusoft Web Studio that. Uh, minimize or eliminate vulnerability to cybersecurity threats. So first, a very brief introduction, just a segue from what Richard uh, explained so far. Uh, as pretty much anything else in business, it comes to people, products, and processes, and security in general or cyber, 
cybersecurity specifically is not an exception. So uh, not only you have to use products that provide tools uh, to protect your data, to protect your information, to protect your uh, physical system, especially industrial automation, where we link the physical world with the logical world, but also you need to have processes in place uh, for the product to be effective, like uh, uh, Richard mentioned some of them, like access to people in, in certain room, rooms, uh, processes to change the passwords or, or uh, enforce uh, secure passwords. Uh, so the product without the process processes is just one piece of the puzzle and will not enforce uh, a strong system as a whole. And people is also part of the, the, the whole picture. You can have a product that protects everything with passwords. You have, can have a process to enforce passwords to be changed, to have strong passwords. But if someone writes the password on the wall, uh, the, the process and the product becomes way less effective uh, because people are not following the processes and not using the correct tools in the product. So at the end of the day, it's like everything else in, in business comes back to people, products, and processes. And another way to see that is that is not only product per se. Uh, if you see in a broader range, it starts with the infrastructure, things as Richard mentioned, segregation of networks, where you have your switches, where you isolate your networks, where there is physical connection to the system, how this physical connection is protected. So infrastructure as a whole, regardless of the software products and applications, that you are running. Then there is the platform layer. Uh, simplistically speaking, you can uh, assume the operating system or even uh, some firewalls running on top of the operating system. And uh, Richard mentioned some examples like configure the OS to uh, 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 disable uh, USB sticks to be connected to the devices. Uh, I've been uh, more than once uh, to large facilities, very large facilities, where computers have been infected by USB sticks. And, and there is an easy setting in the operating system just to, just to disable the USB port. And uh, we have been doing that in many different plants and uh, in, in the ones where the system was literally uh, brought down by the vir virus. After we made those changes, they, they were not infected anymore. And by the way, those are systems that were not even connected to the internet whatsoever. They were completely isolated systems on the machine level. And those kind of actions are actually isolated from iSCADA products, for example. They are on the platform level actions that you have, have to take to safeguard access to the computers to the system. Uh, and it goes way beyond Windows. Uh, the, the, the notion that virus uh, exists only for Windows is actually false. Uh, Windows is obviously a major target for, for many, many virus, uh, but there are virus for virtually any platform available, even proprietary platform. Uh, and StackNet somehow was a proof of that, was infected on the PC, but eventually was sent to the PLC, which is running, uh, in that case, a proprietary OS. Uh, products, that's where Indo Software Studio comes, uh, at least as a SCADA system. So the products need to provide you tools to easily and efficiently protect your information, protect your system. And the next slides for the rest of the, the webinar, I will pretty much provide a checklist of the main features in the Software Studio that should be configured or at least assessed when you are deploying a SCADA system in regards to cybersecurity. And finally, the application. So uh, you can have the infrastructure, the platform, the product, but if you design the application with vulnerabilities to injection, uh, making passwords readable and, and things like that, then you decrease the, the, the security of the overall system. Bottom line, there is no silver bullet. There is not one single thing you can do or one single uh, equation or, or piece of the puzzle that you can attack and make sure that everything is secure. 
There is a famous analogy uh, of a house with, uh, with a system saying that you can have a door with 10,000 locks, but if you leave, leave the window open, uh, your house is as vulnerable as if you didn't have a door. So it's the same thing here. There is no silver bullet. That's why sometimes webinars or, or books or, or white papers about cybersecurity are so broad and so vague. But the whole idea is to bring the awareness that uh, there is value in creating, of course, uh, automated system. There is more and more value to connect your system to broader uh, networks. We see IoT, Internet of Things, uh, growing really, really rapidly and bringing information from the plant floor, to, from the process floor, not only to the enterprise level, but I would say to a global enterprise level. And people do that because there is value to do that. With all the vulnerabilities, all the threats that Richard talked about, you could think that uh, banks, for example, would not offer online transactions, but they do because there is a lot of value in online transactions for banks, as there is a lot of value to bring information from the plant floor, from the process uh, level to the enterprise, to do things like just-in-time, control inventory, uh, remote analysis, there is a lot of saving and a lot of efficiency and productivity that can be achieved with features that we provide in the product to bring information from the plant floor to the enterprise or even to manipulate information on the plant floor. So the question is, uh, how can you then reap those benefits and design a system that is as secure as possible? And the next slide is pretty much a, a simple checkbox of main features we have in the product. I will not get into too much details for any one of them, but at least provide you with a list of features and interfaces that should be uh, at least analyzed, if not configured, for any SCADE application you deploy within the software studio. So again, we are going to focus here on the product for the next slide, while Richard talking, talked a little bit uh, more about the other aspects of cybersecurity. So the core components of Indosoft Web Studio uh, for security is what we call the security system. So switching here to the development environment, under global, you have the security folder, and if you you can security system uh, settings. I'm not getting to that is what we call security mode, and you have four options. First of all, the security system is pretty much where you define the groups, the users, and the rules, the rights and restrictions for each user in the system. So pretty much you can define uh, for whoever logs on the application locally or from a remote thin client what that user can and, more importantly, cannot do. Configure the security system in four different modes. There is what we call local only, so you create your groups, your users, your rules locally, and everything is stored on the same runtime station where you run the application. The default one, very simple, standalone applications. There is a distributed one, so when you have a, a network with more than one station running in the software studio, even with different applications, it can be useful to make them share the same users, the same groups, the same rules. Uh, so if you change the password in one station, this password is automatically changed in all stations. The configuration is very simple. You just define one of the stations as this, the distributed server stations, and in the other stations, you define them as distributed clients and define the IP address or computer name of the server. So the server will be pretty much the gatekeeper that keeps all the clients, all the runtime clients, uh, synchronized for security settings. Usernames, passwords, when you create a user, remove a, remove a user, change uh, policies, change passwords, everything is automatically uh, updated across all the stations in the network. So you minimize or eliminate the risk of having one station uh, outdated with older users, older passwords, for example. And final, finally, what we call domain LDAP, which is the ability to share the groups and users from your Active Directory 
in your application. So Richard mentioned about having a, a way to centralize, uh, manage users and passwords and groups and rules and so on. This interface in the product allows you to do that very easily. So instead of creating uh, groups and users in your application, you literally share the groups and users and passwords from the Active Directory, and you still have the flexibility to define the rules right here in Indosoft. Uh, the rules that make sense to your system. But if someone from IT changes the, the password for the user, this password is automatically changed for your SCADA application as well. So there are advantages to use a centralized uh, security system for authentication uh, using this LDAP in, uh, interface. Then when you go into the security system settings, you have two group settings and for runtime and advanced set things like enforcing the, the password uh, strength when the user has to change password, force the user to change password from time to time. So even if someone gets his password today, at least in a few days or a few months, whenever period of time you define here, uh, you'll be forced to change this password and then the vulnerability is eliminated. And, and things like auto log off. So if someone is attacking your system and is trying different passwords to log on as a particular user, you can automate after a number of attempts, then generate an alarm or remote notification and use other tools to find out where the attack is coming from. And if you decide so, then unlock the user. But they are all built-in tools, very easy to configure, uh, check-in-the-box kind of configurations from the security system interfaces in the software studio. The security system affects the local system and the thin client stations as well. It's a centralized, is the core of the security uh, tools in the software studio. But we have some specific settings to protect remote thin clients, remote web browsers, or secure viewer thin clients, or SMA thin clients, mobile devices that can connect to your application and visualize or even control uh, information from your application, which is a great feature we make available in the product. There is a lot of value on that. That's why several customers use it. And because of that, we uh, offer specific, specific tools and features uh, to allow you to have an extra protection for remote access. So the security system that I showed before is the core uh, way in interacting clients. You can define all the rules and if they are not. So, so all those rules here are affected by the thin clients as well. If all the authentications are made on the server, so when the thin client attempts to do something, even log on, the client sends the information to the server, the server makes the decision and sends the, the response to the thin client. But then become important uh, to be able to protect the information exchanges between the thin client and the server, and also make sure that only authorized physical clients can access your server. So here under project, we have uh, uh, several web settings, and some that are specifically for security is what we call IP security. You can define the ranges of IP addresses, and only thin clients on those ranges can access the server. So when you have thin clients in a local area network where you control the IP addresses, it can be a handy tool to avoid ex external devices uh, try to connect to your server. And here in advanced, you can enable the web tunneling gateway and enable security SOC layer, SSL, which is strongly recommended for web-based applications, especially when you, the thin clients have access to your server through the internet. So this option, along with SSL enabled in Microsoft IIS, the web server, from Microsoft will automatically encrypt and encapsulate all the messages exchanges between the thin clients and the server and make it impossible or at least very hard 
for anyone that is sniffing the, 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 the packages between the sync lines and the server, infiltrate information or extract information from, uh, from the, the network, from the sniffing. Data protection. Data protection was a feature recently introduced in the product, and the idea, that the whole goal for data protection uh, is, number one, to make sure that all the credentials that you save locally in your computer are extremely well protected, make it very hard for someone to extract authentication information, like especially usernames and passwords, from your project files, from your project configuration, uh, and make sure that uh, they do not, not only, if someone gets your project and tries to run your project in a different station, in a different computer, it will not work there unless the person that's installed in that computer knows the data protection master password. So the whole idea is everything in the product that requires authentication even to external systems, if you enable data protection, those authentication informations will be strongly encrypted when they are saved in the system. And if you try to run this application in a different computer, you will need to know the master data protection password to re-encrypt and re-enable those, uh, those credentials in a different station. So uh, here I just listed the main interfaces in the product where uh, you can define and configure and save authentication information, username and password, the security system, mail, SMTP settings from the project uh, settings. You may need to use a username and password to connect to an external FTP server. Database connection, you, uh, depending on your database configuration, you may need to configure a username and password to connect to your database or historian. In remote management, uh, when you're using the software studio development to manage a remote runtime, uh, you can configure usernames and passwords on the runtime to make sure that only authorized people can access the remote system. So uh, how do you configure uh, data protection? Different interfaces where you can uh, configure data protections, uh, but the main one is here under project options, and you have this option data protection. So if you enable it, you will define a new password for data protection, and from this time on, every time that you define a password for email, for database configuration, for security system, whatever it is, it will be encrypted using this password. And uh, based on the user uh, uh, locked on your operating system in this computer and based on this computer itself. So if you move this application or if someone moves this application to a different uh, computer, they will need to know and enter this data protection password in order to re-encrypt the users and passwords valid for the new computer and user. Otherwise, they will not be able to use the authentication settings, the usernames and passwords that you configured on the application. So that's the whole idea about data protection to increase substantially the protection for authentication settings that you configured on the application. And just a little bit more details, when you enable data protection, uh, we save in the data protection subfolder of your application one file for each user station that defines the master password. So if you have a development environment and uh, two or three runtimes, you can, from the remote uh, uh, agent from the execution environment, uh, connect to the device, define a username and password for that device, and those files will be saved in the database, uh, in the data protection subfolder of the application. So at least for those devices, you don't have to keep entering the data protection over and over again. We save all those files in the data protection. So at least for the files where, for the stations and users where this application must be used, you have a collection of data protection files with the properly encrypted uh, username and passwords. Traceability. Uh, we have all those tools to protect your application, but what if someone 
uh, hacks into your system or even attempts uh, to hack into your system or, or even does something that was not supposed to do. So it's very important to measure as well the results of your configuration and there are many different tools in the product to do that. But the main ones are the event logger that you can access from global. The event logger allows you to log uh, many different events from the system into a proprietary file or to an extent. One of the options here is, for example, security system. So all the security system actions will be logged, including invalid attempts to log on with the invalid password, and we log the, the username that's trying to be logged on, the station, the computer IP and name where someone is trying to do that. So we keep logging all the attempts to the security system. And we have also electronic signature. So to enforce uh, uh, extra security for any commands, any actions that uh, require the user to be uh, authenticated, you can enable the electronic signature, and we also log this information, all the actions taken by the user with this electronic signature. Uh, finally, we have the standard alarm management system in the product in remote notification. So whenever you detect anything that should not be done, uh, things like invalid uh, passwords uh, uh, several times or, or uh, electronic signatures not being properly executed, you can configure the application to generate an alarm and or send a mail or text message or remote notification telling you someone is possibly trying to attack your system. So again, uh, this was just a, a basic checklist of the main features in the software studio uh, that allows you to configure your, your application in a secure way against cyber attacks. But if you have further questions, uh, we'll be more than happy to provide further uh, details and even consulting services to help you design the application and deploy the application in the most secure way possible. So with that, Richard, uh, give control back to you. And we will right. open for Q&A. If anyone has any questions, feel free to write them into the chat box or in the Q&A box from the webinar. Our first question is, uh, could you please go over the third-party risks that some companies uh, use that attackers could ultimately gain access to organizations? Um, I had a slide back there, but uh, basically off the top of my head, it's things like uh, spear phishing, emails, uh, USB drives, social engineering is a big one um, by just throwing USB keys into a parking lot. Uh, people pick them up and plug them in. It happens all the time. Um, any surreptitious emails. Uh, they also have, uh, have uh, started introducing websites that look like the real thing but are not. Uh, and when you click on links within that website, uh, it will download malware to your systems. Uh, so um, in a control system, uh, access to the Internet should be limited at minimum and probably completely cut off because it's not needed. Um, and uh, it should be uh, deeply embedded into a... Um, a, a subnet or its own network uh, that is uh, protected by other equipment. Um, off the top of my head, those are the things that, that initially come to mind. There's probably a whole laundry list of things that I could, um, that I could recite. But uh, if you look in NIST um, 853 uh, and 882, uh, there are uh, there's a lot of guidance about how um, attacks uh, the, what the attack vectors are, how to prevent them, all of that sort of thing, and um, and there's also uh, on most of the or all of the antivirus sites there are also uh, discussions and blogs on uh, covering this uh, in quite a lot. Uh, next question: Can you set passwords? for Indusoft 
Web Studio application. Uh, absolutely. Um, as Fabio mentioned, uh, you have the ability to uh, establish passwords for um, access to the application itself to develop it. Uh, and there are uh, a whole variety of user and group uh, passwords and access, um, uh, access uh, choke points uh, that are password protected or otherwise encrypted. Um, and uh, it's completely up to you as the developer uh, how you can choose um, uh, what security you want to implement, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, if you have uh, another uh, question or you want more information, uh, like I said, send an, info, uh, send an email to info at indosoft.com and uh, we'll get it over to Fabio who will reply to you uh, directly. Are there tutorials on the security setting functions for Indosoft software on your website? Um, there aren't any specific uh, tutorials uh, for the new functions that Fabio just introduced uh, yet. Uh, we're planning to introduce them. However, there is a uh, webinar uh, or a, a, um, a training uh, for um, security settings um, in, um, that have existed in DeSoft for quite some time. So all of the new uh, things uh, that uh, Fabio mentioned uh, are in our help manual. And uh, it basically, he covered them in, um, in some detail, uh, but we will provide uh, advanced training uh, on this at some point. OK, so there is one question here. I have a Windows C project that serves data with the Modbus slave driver in TCP mode, exposed to the internet with a fixed IP. Do you recommend to uh, what do you recommend to secure the system? A excellent question. So if I understood, you have uh, a device running Windows CE, and this device is pushing data to somewhere, to a central server or something like that, using the Modbus TCP protocol. Uh, and of course, the Modbus TCP protocol uh, is not encrypted, is not secure. So there are different ways that you can do uh, to increase the security on the system. Uh, the, the first one is the fact that Modbus is inherently uh, not secure. It does not require authentication. It's not encrypted or so ever. So it depends what the system on the other end supports. If the system on the other end supports only Modbus and nothing else, then uh, you have to keep the Modbus protocol and what you can do to increase the security is more on the platform or infrastructure level, like for instance, use a VPN, a virtual private network between your Windows C device and the central server to uh, encrypt the connection, not on the protocol level, but on the connection level, or on a lower layer. If the system up there supports other protocols, uh, like OPC UA that requires and supports authentication, or even if the system on the enterprise is in the Soft Web Studio, instead of using Modbus, you could use, uh, for instance, in case you have Windows CE running C View from Indosoft, and on the cloud, on the server, on the enterprise, you have in the Soft Web Studio running on the regular PC, you can use the standard TCP IP client and server modules from Indosoft instead of using Modbus to exchange data between the server and the C device in an encrypted and secure manner. I think at this point that we are a little bit over the one hour. So uh, we would like to thank everyone and each one of you for attending the webinar. We do appreciate your attendance. Uh, hope to see you again in the next Indosoft webinar. And as always, if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to contact us through uh, email, phone, chat, and all the information is available on our website under www.indosoft.com.